Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from, uh, from, for the audience. Welcome to this public forum co-hosted by the Center for Geopolitics at the Cambridge University and the Institute of East Asian Studies at UC Berkeley. I'm Quentin Lin from the Center for Geopolitics. I'm the Deputy Director. Uh, thank you for being here today. Today, we're discussing Chinese maritime power in the past and present. This is the concluding event of a four-day con uh, four conference feels like four years in terms of our planning, entitled Maritime Asia, the Securitization of the China Seas in the 19th to 21st century, during which we heard many interesting informative papers, original research from both historians and international relations specialists in the region. Uh, I want to refer back to Hedley Bull, uh, our British uh, sort of international relations theorist. Back in 1976, he, talked, he offered this research question on sea power. He asked the question, what political purposes does sea power serve? And why do nations seek to exercise military at sea? And from his perspective, sea power serves at least four purposes, to protect commerce in times of peace and sea lanes of communications in times of war, to offer aggressive purposes, such as projection of power over space, expansionism, influence, to deploy strategic weapons, such as nuclear deterrence or take countermeasures against enemies' weapons, and lastly, to acquire sea resources. So in our interdisciplinary approach, we've tried to understand the fundamental logic of some of these questions from different perspectives, uh, reaching back to history of the imperial, republican, and communist go uh, governments of China and the neighboring countries. So we try to look at the self-understanding as a sea power of China, Japan, and other countries, that have shaped the interactions of these Asian countries with transnational agents such as merchants, migrants, and Asian and Western powers. So we recall uh, Professor Wang Gongwu at, uh, in Singapore's famous uh, characterization of Southeast Asian diaspora Chinese as merchants without empire, or Leonard Blusi's uh, adopted terms of informal empires, different ways to conceptualize China, its tributary systems, and other actors. We also looked at how state and non-state actors build maritime networks and integrate their networks with Western networks and institutions. Additionally, we examined how the Chinese maritime ambitions and self-understanding have been uh, shaped by adapting foreign frameworks and languages for defining its national interests, and which is very clear, clearly manifested, mani manifested in the recent controversies over the UN's uh, uh, Convention for Law of the Sea. And lastly, we examine uh, from perspectives of Japan, Taiwan, and other countries in the regions, how their counter strategy to great powers increasing presence in the seas, uh, uh, the regional seas, indicate a strong regional demand for improved governance, which is exemplified by, for example, Japan's call for free and open the Pacific in recent times. And ar uh, around and in closing all these discussions is the role of non-human actors, the importance of environment, geography, and climate in driving our responses. So today I'm very pleased to present five world-leading experts, historians, and political scientists in examining some of these issues and bring to you our findings from our conference. But before I do that, I, I need to do a little bit of housekeeping uh, for you. Um, obviously, the, uh, the, the event is for budgeted for two hours, but I will ask for your forbearance that I'm going to end the event in an hour and a half. This is for humanitarian purposes, because some of us are actually burning midnight oil, literally sitting in Asia, uh, very late for our panelists. So I, I will beg for your uh, uh, forgiveness that we will have to respect their uh, human rights. And then uh, second thing is that uh, as audience, you are suggest uh, you're very much welcome to participate. So you have to put forward your questions to us, to the panelists using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to submit them. And please do offer your name and institutions when you submit a question. And you can do that at any point. Uh, we will compile the questions and I'll try to get through as many of them as possible and sometimes bundle them together. Uh, this event is being recorded and will be made available on the center's website and YouTube channels in the coming days. Uh, the addresses will be added to the chat shortly along with our Twitter handle if you'd like to tweet about today's sessions. Thank you very much. Um, and of course, we'll encourage you to sign up for the Center for Geopolitics emails using the link that's posted in the chat or from the Center's webpage. Now, without further ado, let me quickly introduce you to our uh, eminent speakers. Uh, we have Professor Paul Cassell from University of Michigan, 
Professor Yuichi Hosoya from Keio University in Japan, Professor Melissa McCauley from Northwestern University, Professor Chiting Tsai from National Taiwan University, and Professor Wen Xingye, uh, the co-organizer of this entire event from UC Berkeley. Thank you very much. So without further ado, I would like to turn to Professor Ye to offer her opening remarks. Thank you, Casey, um, for uh, that introduction. And uh, it's uh, truly been um, a very um, stimulating conference. And then especially the two hour session that uh, we just uh, shared with uh, participants discussing a whole range of issues um, across the divides of disciplines, namely history and political science, uh, international relations. So what I would like to do here is just to, uh, to offer um, a very quick bullet point style um, presentation about uh, some aspects of uh, our of our um, uh, some highlights of our discussion, and um, and then leave it to uh, uh, our our fellow panelists um, to uh, come in from other directions. So uh, the dimensions that I'm going to uh, focus upon is actually uh, issues about time, space, and processes of learning. So um, uh, let me start with a bit of an anecdote to explain what I mean by the temporal spatial dimension. Namely, that in the summer of 1840, in the middle of the Sino-British Opium War, the emperor of China put a list of urgent questions to his top ministers. He essentially asked, who are these English people? Where do they come from? How are their, um, how did their troops get here in the first place? Why such a mix of people, dark skinned as well as light skinned? How are these troops being compensated? But then going beyond who are these people? He asks, where is England, how is this country governed? What is the size of its territories? How do English ships reach China? And then, so that's questions about geography, political science, institutions, and so forth in other dimensions. And then above all, um, the kind of question that invariably confused English uh, British officers who were captured as prisoners of war. The emperor's question here, are there overland connections from England to China by way of Russia and the Muslim regions in Xinjiang? Now, of course, he got no answer for uh, his uh, last question, but his questions, that is his first set of questions betrayed two points to himself, as well as to his uh, top officials and the nation's scholarly elites. Namely, the Opium War was a moment of serious intelligence crises on the Chinese end. And secondly, the regime's um, system, namely of a bureaucratic production of knowledge about foreign places had been utterly inadequate, supplying the dynasty with uh, the kind of information that it needed in times of war. So um, I, in my paper, argued that opium war was a turning point. Um, that is, it's a turning point in the sense that um, this shock of the inadequacy of knowledge and intelligence uh, spurred an expansion of interest or a growth of interest and expansion of Chinese geographical knowledge about the world beyond China. 
in the um, the uh, the the un the paradoxical outcome of that or the transformative effect of that that this expansion of geographical knowledge about the world served to underscore the limitation of the authority, the power, the persuasiveness of the imperial ideology of the Qing. It paradoxically served to underscore the limitation of the reach of Qing power. So that was great to open up um, or to um, create room for successions, decades of reforms, revolutions, etc., to come thereafter. So I, in my paper, argued that, that was a turning point. Our colleagues reminded me that historically, if we think about China's succession of dynasties as a succession of state systems, then this Sino-Western encounter in the middle of the 19th century would certainly not China's very first experience with an international system or an interstate system um, involving multiple ethnicities, multiple states, and a system uh, reaching beyond its borders. Prominent examples here are at least two the War in States period, for instance, was a time of interstate interactions. And the second example would be uh, the Mongol Empire or the Song experience with the Mongol Empire, that Song uh, Yuan transition. So, what is it fair for us to argue that the Opium War was important uh, initiating China? into an international system of a different sort. So my response to that, my reflection uh, upon that, drawing on the comments from our colleagues, is that spatial dimension matters. It was only after the Opium War that the spatial, uh, the scope of spatial imagination on the part of the Chinese people uh, reached the end of the world, so to speak. It was global. And then another part of it about space that was significant is that the spatial imagination or the spatial experience of the Chinese people came to be mediated by technology. Maritime technology, uh, later on aviational technology, so space mediated through technology, these days virtual space, for instance, that space acquired multiple dimensions. And these are places uh, in which dynastic presidents cease to be useful. So it was precisely because the opening up of space, of spatial knowledge, spatial experience, spatial possibilities that imperial authority and dynastic claims ended up being contracted or constrained within that kind of a context. So, um, so the spatial dimension mattered. It carried political ramifications. And then in contrast today, we find ourselves um, observing yet another moment of an interesting turn, namely China again turning historical in terms of its self-representation of what China is, who the Chinese people are, and so forth. So um, most of us are familiar with Chinese self-representation these days about how the China is a culture of civilization of 5,000 years, glorious achievements, and so on and so forth. How the China, um, the China model, it's a superior model for the world to emulate. And with this historical turn, 
the relationship between spatial dynamics and uh, temporal dynamics gets uh, reversed in the sense that this is now China oriented towards its own history or its own sense of self and seeking to project that China outward globally or multidimensionally into space of all sorts. And um, the immediate ramifications there would be in the arena of soft power in areas such as information, knowledge, technology, or intelligence. Um, so um, what then uh, we need to recognize as historians at this point is that China at this present moment, at, at the beginning of the 21st century, it has closed a whole chapter on its 19th century. So a second point that I would like to, um, can you see how much time do I have? Please continue. Okay, mm -hmm. so a second point that I would like to, um, to uh, touch upon briefly, drawing on the presentation of our colleagues, is the whole issue of learning. Learning in the sense of acquisition, of knowledge, of insights, of intelligence, of experiences, etc., from a non um, on the part of the Chinese from the non Chinese world, either within the context of a community of um, nations or an international order of nations or an international society of nations, and for this for such learning or mutual or acquisition of insights and. Uh, desirable um, information to be acquired on the, uh, by um, non-state actors through acts such as travel, higher education, exchange of research, so on and so forth. So um, on that part, our colleagues um, are, are quick to point out that China has not always simply been a um, on the receiving end as a student of international uh, norms about international order, not at all. China, even under the Jing, had actively participated in the rule making of the world in which we find ourselves. So that's my, that, so that's uh, first point. And the second point is that also, that as China makes its historical turn, China also um, acquires, enhances its ability, let's put it that way, to uh, use international rules either selectively or strategically. In other words, rules and norms acquired, quote unquote, learned, uh, become technical knowledge that would service Chinese or China-centered objectives supported by Chinese um, presidents in, um, in the deployment of, uh, of uh, strategic thinking. And then thirdly, uh, this learning can take place in context of international interactions uh, uh, to the point of what, of acquiring lessons or taking in examples from the negative practice of other international players. An example that our colleagues offered uh, with some, uh, was, uh, some, uh, for example, uh, United States attempting to acquire Greenland under the Trump administration and how that such conduct on the part of the United States, for instance, uh, not just inspire the Chinese, but also give uh, Chinese authorities the confidence that they have the license to subvert rules at the same time as they master them. So those are, um, I think those are the, the points I would like to um, 
I'll simply leave it there. And um, let's turn to our colleagues. Thank you very much, Wenxing. So I think you pointed out something that's you know overarching and very important. And if I may just add to that, you, you were suggesting that the state building process that China has experienced since the decline of the Qing Empire has actually gone through this whole, almost a full cycle from understanding itself in a geographical sense to today uh, with uh, um, the General Secretary Xi Jinping and his the elite who are beginning to bring a sort of rehistorical rehistoricization of China, Chinese government's legacy, uh, its legitimacy and its lineage. And that project is sort of projecting itself onto the different ways that China is exercising its power through networks of trade, uh, finance, migration, and other influences. So this is obviously very important to understand China's impact on the world. Now, um, one of the key thing is how the neighboring countries have responded to that. And for that, we turn to Professor Hosoya to tell us a little bit about Japan's self-understanding of its role and how it's evolved. Thank you. Uh, Yuichi, please. Well, thank you very much indeed, Keishi, and thank you very much for having me in this wonderful conversation on the maritime uh, China or China as a maritime power. Uh, I'm not a China expert, but uh, on the other hand, I'm teaching diplomatic history of the 20th century, and also I'm writing and talking about Japanese foreign and security policy by combining two things, historical discipline and international relations discipline. I would like to today provide a Japanese viewpoint on China's maritime power or the China's trajectory as a maritime power. Uh, in the beginning, I would like to say, and I would like to also focus on the importance of understanding that Japan has been influenced by Chinese maritime activities, but at the same time, China has been influenced by Japanese maritime activities because basically Japan has for a long time been a maritime nation. And, uh, but uh, in the last 150 years, uh, Japan has experienced uh, quite big fluctuations, quite big transformations uh, as a maritime nation. Uh, let me uh, tell you why it is so. In the beginning, from the 19, mid to 19th century until the, uh, 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 the, the First World War, Japan uh, was trying to become an equal sovereign power to Western colonial powers. At the time that Japan was in danger of being invaded by powerful, mighty Western powers. So it was necessary for Japan to create a quite modern navy. I would say that Japan uh, is the first country in Asia to create powerful, mighty, modern Navy. To do so, Japan was trying to defend its own country. But after becoming the third biggest Navy in the world during the First World War, Japan, on the other hand, was beginning to have another mission. Another mission means that Japan was trying to create a quite Asianist, closed exclusive or, or, or autarky area in East Asia. And it was called as Greater East Asian Co-Prosperity Sphere. So it means that Japan uh, tried to remain as a maritime power. But at the same time, Japan was trying to become a continental power by invading both China and Korea, by controlling these things, by controlling uh, 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 both China and Korea, Japan was trying to become a, a strong army country. So Japan needed to have a strong army to control these area, to try to uh, prepare for the possible war against Soviet Union, powerful, which had a powerful, of course, army. But at the same time, Japan remained a maritime power. That's why Japan needed to have uh, the powerful Navy. During the First World War, German Navy was defeated by basically a British Navy, Royal Navy. But after the end of the First World War, Japan didn't have real strong enemy because in the beginning, the UK was an ally to Japan and German Navy was defeated. And largely because of the Russian Revolution, uh, Russian Navy, Imperial Navy was also abolished basically. So that's why there was no strong enemy in maritime Asia to Japan. So that's why 
Japan was beginning to think that the United States Navy, the United States uh, would become a powerful, mighty Japanese enemy. To do so, of course, the Japanese Navy could have a, a, a much more budget for creating a bigger Navy. So from the, from the end of the First World War until the beginning of the Second World War, Japan was becoming to uh, be a both powerful, mighty uh, uh, continental power at the same time, Japan was trying to uh, remain as a powerful, mighty naval power. Of course, Japan didn't have sufficient resources to do so. That's why Japan was pursuing two goals. I mean, the Mahanian goal to become a powerful naval country, but at the same time, Mackinderian role as a hegemon in Asian continent. But of course, during the Second World War, Japan was, Japan was defeated by Allied power. So then again, since the end of the Second World War, Japan was seeking another national identity as a maritime power. And the next identity was to become a, a trustworthy ally to the United States, trustworthy ally to the United States, which actually controls the ocean, Pacific Ocean. It means that Japan, Japan was trying to become a, a defender of freedom of navigation, which the United States has been defended. And also Japan was trying to uh, 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 become a quite a, 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 a reliable ally to the United States during the Cold War years. So once again, after the end of the Cold War, Japan needed to find another role. And then Japan was finding a new role to, to, to defend the liberal international order. Even during the Trump years, Japan was trying to defend open and stable seas. And also Japan was trying to launch a new concept of free and open in the Pacific. At the time, the Trump's United States didn't join in the TPP, but Japan was quite resolute, resolved to promote the idea of TPP because Japanese government thought that it was necessary to have it, to have such an, uh, a, a strong liberal international order based upon the free trade. So uh, today Japan cannot become a hegemon in the maritime Asia, but uh, on the other hand, Japan has a much bigger law in the region, in the Indo-Pacific to try to defend both freedom of navigation as well as rules-based order there. Interestingly, I always think that the current China is quite similar to what Japan did or Japan was trying to establish before 1945. It means that the current China uh, seems to be the power which actually tried to establish closed uh, exclusive autarkical area in East Asia. But on the other hand, of course, China has an internationalist element, international, internationalist elements which respect international law or rule-based international order. So I'm wondering further, China is pursuing a course as a trustworthy internationalist power or China was trying to become another imperial Japan which try to create an exclusive area in this area. So I stop here. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Um, I mean, what you mentioned, which is very interesting, is about um, the Mackinder versus uh, Mahanian experience. And of course, uh, the Chinese Navy um, uh, has absorbed both traditions quite a lot. And the question is uh, whether Japan's uh, supportive position of America uh, in well, first of all, in the Cold, during the Cold War in containing uh, communist uh, Russia and, and China, and then today in defending the liberal international order uh, in the conception of the West, uh, whether these are a part of uh, what you mentioned as Japan's uh, defensive tradition since the end of World War II, or if you, in fact, we're seeing a shift in that uh, towards a more offensive engagement. And if so, it will certainly raise security dilemmas for uh, Japan and other uh, Japan's neighbors and other countries. So this will be something interesting to discuss. Now, I would like to turn now to uh, the two uh, legal experts uh, who will discuss a, a little bit about the question of international law and sovereignty and the interaction between East and West. So first of all, let me turn to uh, Park Hassel, please. Thank you. Oh, uh, 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, both uh, Casey and Wenqian, uh, the Institute uh, of Chinese Studies at Berkeley, as well as the Center for Geopolitics for, interview, uh, for inviting me to this um, event. So um, I have a couple of reflections uh, at the end of the conference, and I want to start those with um, Wenqian uh, referring to John Lewis Gaddis' uh, distinction between lumpers and splitters or choppers. Uh, in uh, history. And I think uh, when it comes to my own uh, way of thinking about the international law of securitization and the place of China inside it, I'm uh, definitely a card carrying uh, lumper and not a splitter. I'm kind of drawn to hybridity and mixes. And I think while distinctions are important uh, uh, between diplomatic cultures, between East and West, um, we need to remember that both China uh, and the rest of the world, and especially Europe, have had uh, direct contact for uh, almost a millennia. And it's often hard to trace uh, the origins of, of concepts. And I think in this context, um, it is very important to emphasize that when we're telling the story of China's uh, joining uh, the family of nations, uh, which was famously described by Emmanuel Xi, I think it's very important uh, not to always look at China as the losing end uh, at, the, at, at history, but also uh, that it's been at the winning end of, of, of history. And the story of defeat uh, that we see in the case of China, especially following the Opium War, is not unequivocal. Um, international law has not just been imposed on China, but China itself, of course, uh, has made important contributions to international law and international law in the way we look at it today uh, with a very rather stiff uh, application of, of international so of national sovereignty is also a product of the encounter uh, with China, especially after World War II. And, and also, of course, if we uh, look uh, at, at, the, at the larger context, uh, China uh, has been an, a, an active participant in the building of international organizations. China was a participant in the Bretton Woods Conference in 1944 that set up the uh, monetary system that lasted until the Nixon shocks, the League of Nations. Of course, China was a founding member as well uh, of the United Nations. Uh, and in the drafting uh, of the International Declaration of uh, Human Rights, it deserves to be pointed out uh, that uh, China, uh, in the person of P.C. Chang, uh, made an important and direct contribution uh, to this very important instrument. Of course, sometimes these uh, nuances are lost uh, in the greater picture of things. Uh, and, and oftentimes uh, we face kind of a cherry picking uh, of the narrative, but I think it's very important to uh, take that as a starting point uh, that China as a country, even though it has gone through several regime changes, has been an active participant in, in, um, uh, in, in the forming of, of the world order. So in my paper, uh, I've applied uh, these insights into thinking about uh, or meditate about how the kind of moralistic tone of diplomacy that we've seen uh, in uh, the People's Republic of China actually uh, has its roots in China's socialization in a particular uh, set of circumstances in the international order in the late uh, 19th century. So if we look at the first treatise that China uh, concluded with Western nations uh, after the First and the Second Opium War. None of these treaties actually did assign uh, culpability or guilt. They just uh, uh, settled uh, on the disposition of the settlement of the war. Uh, they usually included territorial changes uh, and indemnities that sometimes were not uh, huge by international standards. Many of the things that, that the world imposed of China at that point in time were things that were applied uh, in the West itself. Now, there's a shift in, in, this, uh, uh, in this policy in the 1860s and the 1870s following uh, a number of uh, uh, diplomatic incidents. We have the Tianjin incident in 1871, in which a couple of dozens uh, of uh, Chinese Christians uh, and French uh, lose their lives in a riot. We also have the Margaret incident in which a British spy uh, or, or uh, adventurer is, is killed in Yunnan. And both of these incidents uh, led to missions of apology uh, that later developed into permanent diplomatic representation. And what is remarkable here is that the West, uh, after a kind of attempts to um, 
forge a conciliatory relationship with China after the Second Opium War opts towards relatively open, uh, open uh, humiliating uh, provisions in peace settlements where China is singled out as culpable of conflicts and also being liable not only to uh, pay um, indemnities and making other concessions, but also to, to deliver formal uh, apologies. And this process, of course, culminates uh, with the uh, Boxer Rebellion uh, in uh, 1900 through 1901, uh, in which uh, China is not only forced to pay uh, relatively uh, large indemnities to the Eight Nation Alliance uh, and their allies, but also to send a member of the royal family to apologize in person uh, to uh, the German emperor, as well as, as uh, erecting uh, memorials on behalf of, uh, of diplomats that had been slain uh, in the early stages of the Boxer War. And what's interesting here, and what's important to remember here, that this is relatively uh, a relatively new uh, element in, um, in international relations, this, design, uh, this designation of uh, culpability. And of course, you could, in, in a certain way, think of the Boxer settlement uh, as a, uh, a dress rehearsal for uh, the peace agreement in Versailles uh, that ended World War I. Now, why is this important to go back uh, the memory lane and to think about these uh, episode, uh, episodes and review them? One is that we see clearly uh, in, in the context between the Boxer War and World War I, a kind of a blowback uh, in which uh, international norms that had been settled sometimes on the fly in China's relationship with the, with the treaty powers sort of goes back to Europe and influence European uh, diplomacy, that extension of international norms from Europe and their modification actually led to uh, an overall modification of, of international norms. And uh, I'm not the only one to have pointed this out, but the very moralistic tone uh, that we see uh, among treaty port communities of, of Westerners in Shanghai uh, and, um, and, uh, and other parts of China, this moralistic tone where people are uh, remembering grievances is actually reversed or adopted uh, by uh, Chinese um, foreign policy beginning in the 1910s and the 1920s with the development of the idea of a century of, hum of humiliation that needs to be atoned for uh, and, and compensated for. So I, I think that's a, a, a kind of a takeaway from my paper. And I think that looking at, at China versus the West in a too stark a fashion uh, in my lumper set of mind, uh, uh, sometimes obscures uh, these uh, nuances, and we had actually reason to talk about that in the context of of other peace conferences in in this um, in this very uh, uh, in 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 this uh, conference. So I'm going to limit my remarks. I, I see I'm hitting uh, eight uh, soon ten minutes, uh, and uh, I will uh, uh, limit my remarks to this and thank the organizers for uh, an excellent conference. Thank you very much, Bert. Um, and of course, the, one of the most important areas of interactions and engagement China has had with international law in recent times is, has been in the law of the sea. So China was one of the uh, original participants in the debates uh, or negotiations leading up to UNCLOS uh, back in the 1970s, uh, adopted a, um, a law of the sea, uh, UNCLOS in, 19, I think it was 1904 or so. Um, and most recently has been on the sort of raw end of a decision um, from Beijing's perspective, uh, Philippines versus China uh, in 2017. So uh, Professor Tsai is here to tell us a little bit about what he thinks of China's responses and what it reveals about the different strands of thinking on sovereignty and territoriality in Chinese legal thinking at this point. Thank you, Professor Tsai, please. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Casey, uh, for your invitation. Uh, for having me here to talk in this uh, public forum, and also uh, thanks for Professor Ye's uh, co-organization of this wonderful conference here, and also um, give me this opportunity to exchange ideas with our audience here. So uh, because of time factor, I will only feature two dimensions here. And the one is the concepts of sovereignty uh, furthered by China. And the other is about how China treat um, non-state actor in the context of South China Sea disputes from international law perspective. So the first point is that um, the concept of for, uh, the 
concept of the sovereignty furthered by China's narrative, I think is that uh, both Westphalian and non-Westphalian. We know that when we try to submit uh, the modern legal justification of territorial sovereignty or historical rights, usually connecting those effective control evidences by a state throughout a long period will lie in the heart of such legal justification. But for countries surrounding the South China Sea region, um, effective control arguably by different governments was not that continuous or evident because of civil war, capability issues, or just lack of interest throughout this long history. So therefore in the South China Seas region, territorial sovereignty discourses, especially the so-called since ancient times narrative needs to be highly relied on the evidence of civilian activities without really being controlled by um, any government and use it as a proof for territorial sovereignty and historical rights claims. So we know that's why, for example, the civilian activities recorded in the Gen Lu Bu or the Manual of Sea Routes by ancient Hainan fishermen uh, was often mentioned by China in its various uh, official statements or documents. But we know that to a certain extent, such logic was not accepted by the South China Sea Arbitration Tribunal. So uh, I think that to a certain extent, uh, China seems to extend uh, this non-Westphalian sovereignty concept actually also to the modern day's Coast Guard law as well, we know just enacted this year. And so, uh, for example, in the Article 22 of the Coast Guard law, it provides that if national sovereignty is infringed by foreign individuals at sea, then it could justify a Coast Guard's use of force against that foreign individuals. And I think that if a foreign individual is directed by a state to enter or invade China's sovereignty, then maybe such action is a kind of infringement uh, on national sovereignty under international law. But if it is not under any direction, then it would be uncertain if that could be really categorized as an infringement on national sovereignty. However, this kind of qualified condition is not really explicitly provided in China's Coast Guard law, which may further blur the condition of broader, uh, broader, broader international law concept, for example, uh, the self-defense concept in the UN Charter. And so another point I want to make out is that uh, to what extent non-state actors can be re recognized as legal subjects and in what sense within the context of the South China Sea disputes. When China, we know that when China talks about sovereignty issue, it seems that non-state actors are treated as state actor, both within its since ancient times narrative and certain Coast Guard law provision I just mentioned. But this logic is somewhat different in China's motivation to strategically employ a gray zone tactic. Although we know that fishermen or maritime militia are controlled or directed by the Chinese government, and they are also pushed to the forefront of this territorial or um, his historical rights disputes. The motivation that they are pushed to this front by China, I think precisely is because they are not manifestly deemed as state actor under international law. So if fishermen can be ca characterized as state actor, then they can be treated as legitimate military target or their fishing vessels can be treated as public vessels, for example, under the US Philippines mutual defense treaty. But there is still no clear answer to this questions under international law, which could actually give China some little uh, legal advantage and leeway to substantially practice certain exclusive control toward the natural resources here, which may further actually undermine the law of the sea regime because of this blurring uh, category. So uh, generally speaking, I think that China uh, is really good at being, from my observation, being socialized or learn or just what Professor Ye just talked about to learn into uh, this legal process in the first place. While in the same time, they learn how to negotiate that original legal boundary by incorporating or practicing its own version of 
uh, law by legalization actions and also blur, blur that original boundary through various tools. So besides the um, examples um, I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, uh, we have already seen various examples actually by China and other issues, for example, like the negotiation of COC. Um, so I think that um, this kind, I mean, I think that this kind of the double categories here in the South China Sea region, if we want to have a strong regional governance through a rule-based international order in terms of, but in terms of this blurring distinction between the notion of Westphalian and non-Westphalian uh, or the, blowing, the blurring, blurring distinction between state and non-state actors furthered by China, cooperation among the South China Sea countries in general will become a little bit difficult if not impossible, because China could actually dialectically or conveniently utilize those two categories in action. So um, I think uh, I have used my time's up, right? So uh, I'll stop here. And thanks for the wonderful organization. Thank you very much, Chiting. Um, I think what you were suggesting also opens up the question of whether the Chinese instrumental use, as you said, of different traditions or approaches to law uh, derives mainly from its observation of how other countries have in hip, you know um, different ways uh, in what we call hypocritical ways you know use international law or is it from a deeper tradition of uh, understanding of rulers subject relations extending beyond boundaries and of course there's a lot of historical studies on that thank you so uh, to bring a great uh, better contextualization of what we're talking about in terms of maritime I mean obviously there's a lot of general literature about how the sea is really a unique so medium and context for interactions. Uh, we will turn now to Melissa, who will tell us uh, more about uh, the environmental aspects of uh, this um, interactions. Thank you very much. Melissa, please. Thank you. I, I, I also would like to thank um, uh, professors Ye and uh, Lin for organizing such a stimulating conference. Um, and uh, also thank the University of Cambridge and UC Berkeley as well as the sponsors for making it all happen. And I suspect someone at some point should thank the inventors of Zoom, because in this day of pandemic, you cannot have an international conference, people from so many different countries uh, gathering together as we normally do um, in healthier times. So thank you to all these people. Um, the interesting thing about an interdisciplinary uh, conference, especially one that brings um, historians and uh, political scientists together, is that it forces the historians, at least, to think about the past um, in terms of the present. I mean, I think with the present is very much in mind. Um, and you just sit there thinking, gosh, I have to read more newspapers and academic journals to keep up on you know, my own age in a way. But, um, we do, but we do do this anyway, but um, a conference like this forces a historian, I think, to think about continuities and change. I mean, what is a constant? What changes um, and how do they change? And I don't have a brief um, answer uh, to these uh, questions, of course, um, especially I'm in Taiwan, it's after midnight. I um, can't extemporize too much, but um, I'd like to, uh, to ruminate on them um, by talking about water. Uh, water, which is eternal, but it is constantly changing. Um, a conference about the South China Sea, um, talking about maritime world, but we were focused mostly on the South China Sea, but also uh, the Indo-Pacific world um, and the Quad. But a conference about the South China Sea um, explicitly or implicitly is a conference about water. Uh, not simply because it involves a maritime geography, but because the Southern Hemisphere is mostly water. It's something like 80% water and 20% land. So it, is it a surprise at all that so many of the conflicts in this region uh, are about ter ter territorial claims to a maritime space? Um, uh, Sunil Amrith, who um, was formerly of the University of Cambridge, uh, now at uh, Yale, he's just moved to Yale, I think. Uh, he has heeded the call of some geographers to put water at the center of the social sciences. Um, he explained uh, how East, Southeast, and uh, South Asia constitute 
what he calls a hydrogeographical region. Um, called, he calls it maritime Asia, uh, monsoon Asia. Um, seasonal changes in the winds uh, profoundly affect climate and precipitation, and particularly in the agricultural sector, have an enormous impact on human livelihood. Uh, farmers and fisher folk learn to adapt uh, to stark transitions between tropical rainstorms and severe drought. Um, and climate change is predicted to exacerbate uh, these extremes. Um, historically, uh, informal agents or local historical actors like these ha have peopled the sea. They're the ones who have mostly been historically operated in this sea. Um, the modern Asian state, with some exceptions, is a relatively late arrival as an agent in the maritime world beyond the coastal littoral um, of its control. Um, but Chinese fisher folk, um, they fished in large fleets uh, and thus acquired a form of security uh, in numbers in unregulated waters um, across time. Merchant networks as well operated in fleets of, of heavily armed junks uh, sailing overseas when the trade winds allowed them. And international trade was predicated on the wind. The wind is in fact shaped in part by water itself as well. Um, so it was not much of a transition for these sorts of fleets by fisher folk, by um, traders to be transformed into what the Chinese state uh, at least uh, called pirates, uh, coastal operators who defied the incessant sea bands of the Ming and the early Qing dynasties to uh, continue to engage in their livelihoods. Um, so it's ironic, I think, that the PRC state today refers to the activities of these actors as the base, as one of the bases for their modern state so-called historical claim to much of the South China Seas because uh, these last two dynasties uh, spent most of their time, certainly after the 15th century, um, persecuting these people um, as traitors to uh, the Han dynasty um, uh, for sailing overseas and defying the legal order of the Qing um, uh, and defying the maritime bands, um, the many uh, incessant mar maritime bands of these dynasties. Um, but it's these sorts of local operators, uh, not just in China, of course, but in the Philippines and Vietnam, Japan, um, all at the edges of the sea, all the people at these edges of the sea, they're the ones who have always had the biggest stake in free and open access to the sea. Uh, in Eastern Guangdong province, um, uh, by the 1720s and probably earlier, very few villages on the coast made their limit living from farming alone. Uh, half of their incomes derived uh, from farming usually, and the other half came from a variety of maritime enterprises or riverine uh, enterprises, fishing, clamming, uh, shell collecting, and seamanship as well. Um, as, as was discussed many, by many papers uh, in our conference, the South China Sea has also been uh, the major source of protein for those who live at its edge. Uh, in, the in the Philippines, Alfred uh, McCoy has uh, told us 90% of that nation's protein comes from a sea that is experiencing profound declines in fishing stock. Um, uh, it is very interesting, as Dr. Uh, uh, Gobella tells us, uh, that the PRC is now relying on Ch Chinese fisher folk to serve as a sort of waterborne militia to help expand Chinese control of ocean waters. Uh, this is, interestingly enough, this is more or less uh, what Elizabethan England did back in the 16th century, which is to say to rely on a freewheeling, independent buccaneer class of pirates, as they say, to expand the maritime power of the state long before the state uh, began to build its own formal naval force. Um, uh, someone in our panel today has just asked um, about, um, uh, you know, are they are they setting themselves up to be attacked uh, because they're now these are informal operators who are now aligned with the state 
with the state, with the Chinese state. And in fact, I think that's actually been the normal state of um, uh, uh, fisher folks, uh, merchants. Uh, you had not just uh, piracy, but, um, um, oh gosh, what's the word? Uh, um, that they often expanded the power of the state and they were called upon to uh, serve as a kind of informal naval, naval force, uh, especially for England, I would say, but uh, in China as well in, early, in earlier days. Um, so uh, it, this is not a novel development at all, I, I don't think. Um, I'd like to close by noting that China's ongoing drive to dominate the maritime waters uh, has also, a, also has a counterpart on the land. Uh, when the PRC took control of Tibet in 1950, it simultaneously took control of much of the fresh water supply of South and Southeast Asia. Um, the Tibetan highlands are, um, uh, are the source of, uh, of at least something like 11 ri river systems, including the Indus and the Salween and the Mekong uh, rivers. Um, so in a sense, the PRC either controls or seeks to establish sovereignty over much of the salt and fresh water supply of Southeast Asia, um, which I suppose fits into our theme of securitization <laughs> in a very fundamental sort of way. Uh, when we factor in the, the uh, prospect of um, climate change, uh, the strategic implications are enormous. Um, but those are strategic challenges uh, to people, to primarily to China's neighbors themselves, um, uh, and on land on and on sea, the tensions of the Indo-Pacific region in general uh, largely come back to this question of water. Um, but I'll end that there. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor McCauley, and clearly that could be extended to various other issues that are um, transregional transporter in, in nature such as you know the depletion of fishing stocks in south china sea the um the the, the damages to uh, the you know uh, local communities that rely on fishing and, and other trade so all this is very important in the regional and global sense of uh, climate change uh, uh, impact um now i think one of the most interesting thing um uh, across all your analysis is this sort of idea of you know disaggregating the state and looking at the relationship between state and local actors. And the state could do the elite learning and they could do the elite interaction with other you know, elites around the world. But um, for the Chinese government for a very long time, and I know this is a gross generalization, but it's always had limited capacity in terms of its governance structure and it, its elite bureaucracies has always been relatively thin. So the implementation has always been done locally and a lot of information has not been forthcoming. And this creates this sort of classic principal agent relationship with asymmetric information until very recently and one could argue today even the Chinese government doesn't have you know reliable statistics on a lot of these things so I wonder if you could all uh, just well, perhaps consider the question of what is different about the 21st century because clearly one of the strong narrative that's out there in the public discourse is that somehow Xi Jinping and building on the achievements of you know Hu Jintao and his other predecessors have really built up a much more powerful Chinese state more powerful in the sense of information, in terms of leverages, in terms of you know capabilities of to project power. So if that were the case, do you see possibly a disruption of these past constraints to deal with these issues? And for example, you know, with Deng Xiaoping, you know, his approach to economic development was to decentralize and to allow local agents to use their information, local information appropriately and incentivize to engage in networks, you know, recreating these networks with diaspora and to start the commerce. Whereas today we see a much more, you know, engineer approach to maritime commerce, emphasizing the state shipping companies like Costco and so limiting and controlling uh, local trading rights and, and trading routes through anti-corruption campaigns and all that. So I wonder if you can speak to this potential change in state building projects and the way that the state approaches the maritime governance issues. Thank you very much. Um, any one of you, uh, please just you know, jump in and that's it. Yeah, Melissa, uh, Melissa yeah. please. Yeah. Because I, I have an idea. Yeah, great, great. <laughs> I'll let other people think this through and I'll just throw this out. What, one thing that is just astonishing, I think in the 21st century is the role of the Chinese state in the South China Sea, larger Southeast Asia region. For, for most of the centuries, the Chinese have been very prominent 
and heavily engaged in the economy and trade and cultural exchanges with Southeast Asia. Um, uh, but economic extraction, so to speak, the ability to extract resources from Southeast Asia, um, that was all done informally by networks of uh, bu business people uh, accompanied by laborers who were from their same native places. And that was a very efficient way to gain the resources of Southeast Asia. It was very informal, it was very inexpensive. Uh, it was from the bottom, or people on the ground, not necessarily bottom up, some of these people were very wealthy, but um, they're, they're, it's from the bottom up, they're organizing their own institutions, the Native Place Association, Temple Associations, philanthropic um, uh, activities, and, um, uh, and that's kind of hard to overthrow. Whereas the uh, formal colonial state is always there, it's always the enemy and eventually it gets tossed into the dustpan of history. And it seems to me that the Chinese, um, the Chinese state was not that involved with that kind of Chinese, the moment of Chinese economic supremacy in, in Southeast Asia, the, let's say the 16th to the um, uh, uh, late 19th, early 20th century. But now the Chinese state is heavily engaged. It's, it's adopting these formal institutions that the old colonial powers used to adopt to try and control these areas. It heavily, it, you know, dependent on militaries, on um, formal state-dominated institutions, if not the state itself. And that's a very expensive and cumbersome way to try to, you know, um, gain economic advantage. Um, and, and so it's 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 actually, I think. A remarkable change I mean, to see the state that involved, and even um, someone mentioned that uh, uh, even if you go back to Zheng He's adventures and so on, that was those were very fleeting. I mean, they were very important um, uh, adventures, but they, they were a fleeting state presence. It wasn't as though they were they had this massive naval presence from you know 1407 on up to the end of the Ming. That's right. Um, well, I, actually, if I may just bring in the question right now. Um, so please do feel free to uh, uh, send me your questions um, uh, via the chat and I'll be uh, taking them as they come along. Uh, so Professor Gwynthian uh, Prince had a question uh, for all of us um, regarding the capability of the PLA Navy. Um, so he argues that, and which I think is correct, that you know, in terms of uh, comparing PLAN to the Anglosphere plus J Japanese capabilities, that the PLAN is you know, to say the least, starting from a point of weakness, even though we all know that right now it has more ships than anyone else, but it has never had that sort of deep, you know, maritime war uh, fighting culture. Uh, it has not been the sea power until very recently. So then what he uh, argues is that, you know, the McKinder question is surely that PL PRC is actually attempting to continentalize or continentalization of the South China Sea. Uh, I'm wondering what you might think of uh, that characterization. Yes, please, Yuichi. Thank you very much indeed. It's a really terrific, interesting question. Uh, we all need to think about the question, the answer to the question. I basically think that uh, as Japan did before 1945, as, in, as I told in my explanation, the current China is trying to pursue two goals simultaneously, to become a strong continental power uh, to become a strong maritime power or sea power. In the 1970s and 1980s, the Soviet Union was the biggest enemy or the threat to China at that time. So that's why they needed to spend a huge amount of resources to prepare for the war against Soviet Union. It means that it must have a strong army. But currently, China has a quite friendly or more or less quite cooperative relationship with the Russia. That's why China now today doesn't have to have a, such a strong army alongside of the border with Russia. It means that China can uh, uh, spend more resources for its own navy. So I think that the now uh, PLA navy is quite strong, not just in numbers, but for uh, financial resources as well. But at the same time, the United States has many allies, partners. 
So it means that now currently the, the United States government is using a word integrated deterrence. It has many meanings, but uh, basically I think that the United States now try to, under the President Biden, now try to utilize uh, its allies to create much stronger deterrence power. So if the United States can mobilize these allies, I mean, Japan, South Korea, Australia, and so on, I think that the United States can match against the more and more powerful Chinese Navy. But at the same time, I think that uh, I really don't know whether China has such a sufficient amount of resources, particularly financial resources, because the population is now shrinking. So it would be difficult, I think, for China to maintain the current level of the growth in spending uh, for, for the budget for both army, strong army, and also strong Navy, and also strong Air Force as well. So uh, I think within a decade or two, China needs to choose uh, for what purpose Chinese budget uh, must be used and further China can pursue two goals at the same time, to become a powerful continental power and to become a powerful neighbor power. And the essence I think of the question is that China has a strong national identity as a continental power. So it means that everything must be territorialized it's totally different from maritime power because maritime power based on usually focus on the importance of public goods. Public goods must be shared by international community. But basically like Russia, China, continental powers always try to territorialize the resources, continent, seas, aerial area as well. So I think that uh, as a continental power, Chinese approach to uh, uh, seas, East China Sea and East China Sea and South China Sea are quite different from uh, American approach or Chi powers approach to the sea. So this is my basic take to the question. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Yuchi. So would you say that there's any lesson to be learned from uh, the British uh, empire experience um, and then naval power experience? And yes, exactly. And obviously had also some of the lineage. Uh, exactly, because UK has always tr tr tried to reject to become a continental power by controlling bus uh, land areas. So I think these are way how maritime power, ship power is trying to behave. Excellent. So um, perhaps following, uh, there's a question uh, from Professor Chris Tomney from uh, Naval Postgraduate uh, uh, School in uh, Mon uh, Monterey. And he points to the sort of extension of technology. So the importance of technologies, and this is very much a point that echoes uh, uh, Wen Xing's earlier point about China's uh, expansion of uh, knowledge about uh, the sea and other realms. So right now, uh, China has, you know, is, is sort of caught up and arguably leading in a lot of undersea, you know, uh, exploration, satellite technology, cyber, and all these extended capabilities and knowledge. How, how do you see that as changing China's strategic calculus to all these domains when China is acting from a position of confidence and knowledge? Can, can I, just because I think I could start yeah. an answer to that question, although I think you has a better answer. You know, I've been reading these depressing reports about, you know, war and who's prepared, you know, to engage in war and this kind of bilateral relationship. Um, put loops all of my life. I've been studying China, and now suddenly I'm reading about when are we going to go to war. I mean, it's it's depressing. But um, I, I, you know, I this this questioner probably knows more about this than I do, but I, my understanding is that there have been something like 18 military exercises that the United States, either alone or with other people, have um, uh, engaged in to see who would win a, a naval or a, a military engagement in the Western Pacific, and each and every one of them, the Chinese won. Um, and it, uh, one point that was really made in, in this particular report I was reading was that 
you know, even if Americans could bring in so much more, can project so much uh, power around the globe, just the cyber uh, warfare alone, you can um, undermine the ability of these ships to communicate with one another and with their satellites and everything, and just completely undermine the ability to use your own uh, military weaponry, which was interesting. But then it, this gets away from the particular question this person asked, but um, so how do you, how does the American, what, what resources do the Americans have to resort to? Um, God forbid about all this, but, and this is where the ability to project power globally comes in uh, from what we're told that the United States could rely on its naval power, you know, and its alliances for one thing, but its naval power to cut off the Persian Gulf, uh, which is half of China's uh, fuel supply. Um, and uh, the United States, in fact, has a network of friends, although how much of these friendships have survived the Trump administration, I do not know. Um, I think a lot of this American decline narrative has started because of that. But, um, but you know, there are economic tools to struggle against it as well. Um, so it, uh, I, I'll stop there, but it's, um, to defeat the kind of power that the Chinese have currently in their own neighborhood would require the kind of global resources that the United States has and has been kind of disparaging in the recent years. Yes, and then um, if I may just add to that, um, I, I think what uh, Chris uh, told me would know very well is that this obviously opens up to in military uh, context, you know, the multi-domain warfare uh, uh, concept and the strategies. And perhaps this is where, um, we can examine where the, the Chinese approach toward building the POA SSF uh, compared to American approach uh, could have different outcomes and how that impacts uh, the alliances in Southeast Asia and elsewhere. And certainly from a so influence perspective, uh, these capability uh, would make uh, countries like Philippines will think twice about you know, what, what it means to have uh, American security alliance. Uh, Professor Ye, please. I would like to uh, simply add to this, namely that about the exploration of the maritime, um, the, the mediation of technology certainly is very important. And then if we are going to think in terms of uh, competitiveness uh, between nations, it's uh, notable that uh, China's uh, investment in higher education in R&D in that area for the past 20 years or so, it has consistently allocated all up to 6% of uh, its, uh, its uh, um, budget uh, to such activities. Whereas we out here at state funded universities, we see a steady decline um, in our um, um, allocation of uh, funding. And then the model of uh, scientific or technological development uh, as, um, as uh, it has taken root in China, uh, you've, we find resonance uh, in the science parts in places like Taiwan, in um, uh, Korea, for instance. And it's very much the kind of uh, comprehensive integration of uh, industry, um, science, uh, research, and then also um, education or educational training, and very often in partnership with uh, an agency of the state um, offering the kind of inf uh, policy or infrastructural support. And uh, in the hope, of course, of duplicating something like uh, the Silicon Valley. So that in that sense, there is this whole dimension of international circulation or conversation about advanced uh, knowledge, which is uh, equally important. And we've seen, especially in uh, recent years, how that such circulation has triggered uh, security concerns in conversations. Um, in, um, um, in the defense sector. Uh, Chinese research very often would blur the distinctions between applications for military or civilian uh, uses, and that's another area of concern. 
and to uh, add to um, an early, a, a point to this earlier conversation about the continental mindset in its approach to the maritime domain, I think that the, uh, the output of all of that is something that Professor Tsai can comment upon uh, 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 much, much more compellingly than I can. Namely, it's about the state's treatment or assessment of the strategic value and importance of coastal islands. And uh, in, uh, with regard to the South China Sea, for instance, we know the significance of Hong Kong, uh, the importance of Taiwan, and then also the importance of the uh, Hainan Islands. These were places once upon under the purview of the Qing Dynasty. These are places that you may as well give them away. Who wants them? It's a speck of land out there in the middle of nowhere. That's what that's the definition of islands. But then at this moment, there is a complete reversal in strategic thinking or in um, national assessment of the value of these uh, islands. So to connect with the point that Professor McCauley has made, namely it's about to formalize and to institutionalize control of coastal islands, coastal areas, and then also entire sphere of economic and social activities, which under the dynastic rulers had been informal, had been bottom up in that sense. So those are some of the very notable changes that I suppose we can observe if we are going to uh, conceptualize along this line of the continentalized conception of territorial construction of uh, watery regions. Thank you very much. And perhaps at this point, I could just quickly ask a question for Pa and uh, Chi Ting uh, about the relationship between domestic legislating and international law. And this is something that's alluded to in what uh, Professor Ye's uh, comment is the, the so codification as well. So uh, when before China engaged in a lot of these disputes, you know, and then sort of uh, stepped up its assertiveness in, uh, well, basically 2012 is a critical moment onwards, uh, China obviously put in domestically a lot of these legislation and built capacities on Hainan Island, including creating new administrative uh, status for South China Sea, uh, the Sancha. So uh, I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about that relationship, please. Um, so, Pan first or? Go ahead. Okay. Um, I think that um, this can bring us to the um, the paper I, I wrote for this uh, conference. It's about the legalization uh, concept. And um, legalization, actually, the essence of the legalization, I think, is uh, practice. And um, I think that before the uh, 19... 1989 or before the end of the Cold War, uh, when we talk about the domestic legisla le legislation or domestic law and international law, I think it's quite distinct. And so it's very two different spheres. And so usually we don't say that the domestic uh, legislations um, can be treated as international law. Um, but to a certain extent, yes, I mean, customary international law. But that is not that uh, obvious, obvious before the end of Cold War. But after the Cold, after the Cold War, we see that the transnational law concept becomes very influential. And so this, ironically, like in the globalized world, it gives China another kind of the justifications to legitimize their maritime crimes or the coastal, coastal islands regulation governance through those domestic legis legislation to claim their different historical claims or the historical rights claims or the uh, sovereignty claims here because domestic legislations can be a part or can be a source for international law under the transnational law uh, viewpoint. So I would say that um, after the 1990s, uh, domestic legislations uh, becomes more legitimate to, become, to 
you know, to further China's uh, sovereignty or his historical rights claims there. So that's why I think that in the South China Sea arbitrations, the tribunal tries to uh, trump that kinds of the argument and by saying that uh, maybe domestic legislations or maybe that civilian activists cannot be a really authoritative source for that. So uh, I think that is my uh, very brief comment for the uh, relation of domestic legislation and international law here. Well, of course, uh, just like uh, Melissa, I'm, I'm more rooted in, in China's um, uh, 19th and early 20th century history. Uh, and perhaps I should read more newspapers. Um, always a good idea. Uh, but when it comes to the international relationship between domestic law and international law in the period I've studied, uh, predominantly the, uh, mainly the late 19th through the early 20th century, I often find that uh, the then uh, Qing government um, was relatively legalistic in its application of, of treaties as they had been concluded and they did not see the treaties as uh, living documents that evolved over time. And, and for instance, when um, China and Japan were arguing over extraterritorial rights uh, in its contact zones, in harbors, um, the Qing Empire did not take uh, lightly to uh, Japanese claims that they were revising their criminal code, they were revising their civil code, they were revising their relationship with the rest of the world. From the Qing point of view, or from the Chinese point of view, it seems that international law in the, in the sense that it was legislated in international treaties uh, took precedent over domestic law and, and they frequently made that point. Um, so so that's, that's what I can say from, from, the, uh, from the historical point of view. Of course, all of that changes uh, with, the, with the reforms in the Chinese legal system with the late Qing, uh, the early Republic and then and later the nationalist government where, where China embarks on a very ambitious um, legislative uh, product. Thank you very much. Now, um, there is a final question, if I could uh, just put, put that forward to you, um, which is the importance of Taiwan and its changing role. So we, we know about the history of Taiwan in, in this sort of the projects in the East and West. Um, the question is whether, for example, as indicated by Japan's uh, uh, defense paper in recent years, whether there is in fact a shift in Japan's attitude towards um, uh, defense of Taiwan or in the treatment of Taiwan in uh, strategic concepts. Uh, perhaps we can start with uh, Uichi and then we can reflect more broadly from a, a historical perspective. Thank you. Oh, exactly. Thank you very much. Uh, in the, at, at the summit meeting between Prime Minister Suga and the President Joe Biden in April this year, April 16th, it was reported that uh, for the first time after more than 50 years, the two countries, particularly Japanese government, included the world of peace and the stability of Taiwan Strait. It was partly right, it was partly wrong to argue that because in the last five decades, repeatedly Japanese government used the word peace and the stability in the Taiwan Strait in much lower level, like in form, for, for a ministerial level. And also between Japanese government and Chinese government, Beijing government, they agree to respect peace and the stability in the Taiwan Straits. Because, of course, it's an interest for the both government, Japanese government and the Chinese government. So it was really careful preparation for the Japanese government to include it, because repeatedly Chinese government actually included the world, peace and the stability in the Taiwan Strait between the two countries, I mean, Japan and China. So Japan actually uh, uh, did not move forward from the previous position, but at the level of prime minister, I think for the first time after 1969, the two sides, but between Japan and United States governments included the world. But I think that uh, this relates to what I, uh, uh, wrote in my paper because uh, what Japan has been trying to defend is freedom of navigation. Every ship must be navigate safely the Taiwan Straits. China cannot fully control the Straits. So in the sense, I think that it is a test for Chinese government whether China is willing to respect 
the freedom of navigation of whether China is re respect both peace and stability in the Taiwan Straits, because Taiwan Straits is not China's property. It's a kind of uh, a public international public goods. So in the sense, I think that uh, China uh, did not strongly protest against the world because, but uh, interestingly, many Chinese scholars and officials didn't know the fact that the two sides, Japanese government and the Chinese government agree on that previously. And in 2005, at the ministry, for a ministerial level, Japanese government and the United States government also included the world, peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. In the sense, I think that uh, it was really careful preparation not to alienate or not to uh, make Chinese government un really angry about that. So this means that the Chinese policy, and um, sorry, Japanese policy is basically to defend the peace and the stability in the region by defending the freedom of navigation in the area. Thank you very much. I think that was actually a theme also in the 19th century. <laughs> Go back to my strings again. Um, uh, when Japan sort of made its move on the Ryukyu Islands was that 1879, um, the Chinese even at that point were realizing that if they didn't control those offshore islands, that there'd be that they wouldn't it would create a, pro a freedom of navigation problem for themselves. And, and in fact, I wonder if anyone's worked on this, um, you know, once Japan not only took over the Ryukyu Islands, but also took over Taiwan, you know, how uh, inhibiting that was for development of naval power in those last decades of the, of the Qing. I mean, not, not that they gave them so what the heck, because of course they did engage in a lot of naval development, but um, it, it was a real security problem for China. Um, um, and that, of course, that raises the kind of disconcerting question about, you know, uh, you know what happens to Taiwan and all this. It, I mean, there's a there was a narrative of decline of America in this conference. Um, as the Americans sometimes, I think, oh, thank God we can go back to getting a, a decent healthcare system or something. But um, it uh, it it is disconcerting because it's kind of wrapping up the business of this 19th century moment when China's strategic interests were, you know, um, China's own strategic interests were uh, undermined basically by the um, taking over of all these islands off, off their shores. Um, well, what do you think China, what would Japan do if China did take over Taiwan militarily? Would, would they do nothing? Of course, uh, in 2015, uh, 16, a Japanese government under Prime Minister Abe introduced a new security legislation. It enabled Japan to support, log uh, well, logistically, American military operations. So I think that uh, basically Japan can support American military activities, but at the same time as an ally to the United States. Japanese government can try to uh, 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 ask or pressure the American government to take a much more moderate course to, to, to stabilize the region. So Japan has many tools to do, not just to sub provide the logistical support to the United States, but at the same time, Japan, Japanese government can ask the United States to uh, take a different kind of course to, to, to negotiate with the Chinese government. This is what Japanese government did before the Iraq war. The Japanese government under Prime Minister Jinichiro Koizumi asked the US government under President Bush to respect international law. If United States government didn't respect international law, Japanese Prime Minister said to the United States that Japan couldn't help United States military operations. This is what I think the current Japanese government is trying to do. Thank you, Per. Last, um, come. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I just wanted to, um riff of Melissa's uh, comment um, when it comes to the territorial integrity of China, which is, of course, uh, a very burning uh, topic. And even though I don't know the answer to the particular question about the Japanese colonization of Taiwan, I think it's important to remember that China, from the point of view of international law, has largely come out of the winning side of territorial uh, disputes historically. So, for instance, first the British um, in the heyday of imperialism uh, was a staunch protector 
of the territorial integrity of China, of course, in order to provide a platform for Britain's own informal imperialism. And then, of course, Britain leaned towards Japan around the turn of the century. But still, China has, you know, e even in periods where China has been, been more than a, just like a geographical expression, um, the rest of the world, um, the imperial powers, the League of Nations, the United Nations have protected the idea uh, of a unified China. And I think it was Hans van der Ven uh, who pointed out that even semi-colonial institutions such as the Imperial Maritime Service and the Postal Services were one of the few institutions that actually uh, gave, uh, made a unified China kind of a relevant, gave it a relevant status on the, on the world uh, stage. And that's again where I think that, that had history turned slightly different, had uh, Chinese diplomats and politicians been uh, not astutely exploiting this, then many of the sovereignty disputes that we're talking about, be they territorial or maritime, uh, would look very different because the Western powers were complicit in the creation of, of the idea of a unified China. Quite so. Thank you. Now I turn to uh, Professor Ye for um, some final remarks. Um, you guys have been just amazing in your stamina, but I don't want to tax it any further. Please, Professor Ye. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, again, this has been uh, wonderfully uh, stimu stimulating. So um, by way of uh, general reflections, perhaps, um, to share on this uh, topic of maritime Asia, um, I think there are three things for me as a historian and, and um, academic researcher. My takeaway here about approaching this topic uh, which uh, contain uh, probably include these three dimensions. The first one is about perspectives, namely that if we adopt a water-centered perspective and then we reflect upon the land uh, and the peoples around a body of water rather than the other way around, we recognize very quickly that a water-centered perspective very often would generate the kind of narrative, historical narrative, that would expose the land-based uh, biases of our conventional narratives. And then also a water-centered perspective invariably would draw our attention, direct our attention more to the side of things like monsoon, uh, currents, winds, uh, climate, temperature, things of that sort, and then going from there, biodiversity, uh, science, technology, and uh, human beings as a whole, as a community of uh, human beings um, in its uh, interspecies relationship with whales and birds and whatnot. So that's my first um, general takeaway. And I should say that perhaps precisely for that reason, maritime as a domain of historical research in the field of China is an underdeveloped area of research. And then the second point is a language issue. Namely, China adopted a whole set of vocabulary, thinking, operating, um, organizing its activities on the sea, especially on the part of the state doing so, China adopted that kind of language uh, through translation so that there are things which gets lost in translation, so to speak, uh, between English that gets spoken as an international language and then also whoever's language, and in this case, uh, Chinese. So that there is this element about things getting lost in translation, but then at this point, as China uh, gains um, uh, volume in its voice, speaking on the subject of China in international discourse, that is um, striving for um, uh, being the hegemonic voice in um, discursive discussion, at least on the subject of China, then um, 
as scholars, we also need to become um, more than monolingual in that sense, right? In a in a in an open broad sense, going beyond the constraint of any particular linguistic domain. So that's my second point. And the third point is about production of knowledge. So what the Chinese learned once upon a time um, through the, the, the uh, shock of the Opium War was that bureaucratic production of knowledge tends to pr produce the kind of knowledge that responded to a very limited set of questions that answered to the mission, the agenda, the objective of that bureaucracy. So in other words, when it comes to the kinds of knowledge that we have out there about what we do know, what we don't know, it would be useful for us to reflect upon the nature of this knowledge. That is, some of these are being filtered through bureaucratic or institutionalized processes, hence embedded in the agendas either of a stage of a this and that and whatnot. And then also uh, with a, 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 um, a certain activism or objective in mind. Um, but then for those of us who can afford to take at least a whole step back and ruminate from an armchair position, it would, also, it would certainly become more be useful for us to think with greater nuance, flexibility, to recognize the contingency and constraint that is contingency of circumstances, constraint upon historical actors and the range of options and the possibilities for change over time. So those are my three general points on language, on knowledge, and on perspectives. Well, wow. and with thank with you. that, with that, I would like to uh, thank all my colleagues, uh, all the participants of our three-day conference. I would like to thank uh, Quentin for organizing, uh, for being the main organizer of this entire event. I would like to thank the Center for uh, Geopolitics at Cambridge University. And then for me, at least, this is only um, the beginning, the preliminary uh, findings of a much larger project. And I look forward to our further exchanges across a whole range of uh, issues. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ye, for your incisive and actionable recommendation for us. Um, we do have, in fact, a longer term project and our new, renewed effort to understand geopolitics in the changing world. Uh, the center has long term interest in maritime security and, in fact, has a new program on Indo Pacific. So, we very much hope to have you back, all of you, in person in Cambridge when we can drink to our collaboration. Um, so, at this point, I want to thank the panelists and the audience for attending and for, for the excellent conversation and, and the questions. Uh, I'm sorry I was not able to answer or put forward all the questions. Uh, if you enjoy the converse, uh, discussion, please do follow us on the social media and check back on our website we'll stay, uh, to stay updated on our work. The video recording of this event will be up uploaded in a few days, and a link to, uh, will be on our website and YouTube channels on the chat. So from all of us uh, at both uh, um, the conference participants and the center, uh, we want to thank you for that and uh, uh, say goodbye for now. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>